extremists. Making your own propaganda, so this, is a very, this is a sign of impending um, action. Intensity of exclusivity, so if it's a really closed group, if they're conducting intelligence or counterintelligence, this is a, they're, they're showing some level of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, of, of tradecraft, uh, they're probably up to something. Uh, contact with known violence extremists, you are the company you keep. And recruiting others. Right? The more you talk about it, the more you talk about it, it reinforces inside, and then you stop talking about it and you start doing it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run me. Oh, these are wild card factors. Uh, so if you're, you know, you're, uh, <clears throat> you grew up in a refugee camp, you were abused, maybe physically, maybe sexually, um, you may go right to violent extremism. For you, writing a letter to your politician, assuming you can even do that in a country where you live, uh, it, it doesn't appeal to them. It's not a vehicle for change or revenge or retaliation. Or in the second category, somebody might he might he wants to try it out, but not really. It doesn't work for, work out for him. Goes right into violence extremism. So here's me growing up. Well, it's not me, but this is exactly the kind of Quran school that I grew up with when I was very young. Five days a week, two hours a day. So, you know, boys sitting at the wooden benches, girls on the other side. If you made a mistake, you were slapped, hit. <clears throat> and this, I think, introduced the idea that religion is something violent. And we were reading the Quran. We didn't understand a word of what we were reading. This is an Indo-Pakistani background. Um, the Quran is in Arabic. We didn't learn Arabic. We learned how to recite, but we didn't learn what we were reciting. Right? But during the day, I'm going to public school. Right? That's me in the front and center with the flared collar. And my mom used to comb my hair. It was great. Um, <clears throat> but mixing boys and girls, multicultural environment, the teachers are nice. They won't slap you if you make a mistake. They weren't mean. So this created an identity conflict, I think, for me, because this, this is a public school in Canada. Yep. Uh, the Quran school was also in Canada. And so by day and by night, there's this, hmm, is it supposed to be like this? Am I supposed to be like this? This is me in high school. I'm at the, that symbol up there looks like the white and black. I'm sitting right next to it in the black tank top, uh, blank hoodie, saying Sister's Cherry on it. Uh, it was a rock band that my high school friends had, and it was great. We, I lived a really, really cliche high school life. I wasn't picked on, I wasn't bullied. Uh, we were the cool kids. And, uh, but unfortunately, I, I had a house party one day, and uh, my parents were overseas, and I called everyone over. And of course, unbeknownst to me, my dad had told his brother to go check on the house while he was gone. So my, my uncle was very hard, rigid, hyper-conservative, and uh, walked in on the party. And uh, all hell broke loose. Um, but of course, after everyone had fled the house, um, he invited all the other uncles to come over. They sat me down in the middle of the room, and they made me feel so bad about what I had done. Defiled the home, dishonored the family, so I thought to myself, the only way that I'm going to make this up is for me to get religious. So, oh, right. I was in the Army Cadets, of course. That's my family now. Two of them are in the Army Cadets. Uh, social engineering, go big or go home, right? Um, and what I'm trying to say is, this is a peer, another peer grouping and another value system that I was exposed to. And, in, and as I'm trying to find my identity, this house party thing happens, and now I realize I need to get religious. So... If you look on the left side, when I looked at when I showed you the first categories of, of things that stand out, I'm already starting to manifest two of them. And in my activism or social expression, so to speak, I went to India and Pakistan. And for those who know that Tablighi Jamaat is a, it's an apolitical group, has nothing to do with politics. But one of the things you do is you walk around the local area and you talk to people and say, look, you know, the, the way to bring about change in the world is to, to follow the commandments of God as shown by the way of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So as I walked around an area and we came upon this walled compound where there was a lot of foliage growing out of it, and sitting on the wall, uh, squatting, were individuals who looked exactly like this. Beards, turbans, robes, and guns. Lots of guns. And so I went up to them, because that's how I am. Um, and I became, and then I said to them, look, uh, this is the way to bring about change in the world. And I gave them, you know, the spiel. And then so he says, well, he says, if you want to change the world, you do it with this. And he held up his AK-47. I thought, okay. That's pretty cool. Um, 
When I returned back to Canada in 1995, September 1995, a group called the Taliban had just taken over Afghanistan. And I realized, wait, wait a second, I, I met these guys. They, they did what they said they were going to do. I'm with them now. I support them. I became a supporter of the Taliban. In 1998, when Osama bin Laden came out with his fatwa, again, you know, jihad against the world, uh, I became a supporter of Osama bin Laden. The individuals that I used to hang around with, I started to dress like this. We started to talk about the foreign policy issues or, or geopolitical conflicts. Uh, 1995 to 2005 years of Chechnya, Second Intifada, Bosnia, you name it. All these things were there. Now, if you look at more of these um, behavioral or these, uh, these things are standing out in my life. Now, if you look at the third category, look at how many of them I'm showing. All right. Now, I was on the verge of going. I, I was given the chance to go to Pakistan multiple times, go to Yemen, no problem. I could have gone, but thank God I didn't. Um, but September 11, 2001, I was driving to work, and I heard a plane had hit the building. And I was so steeped in my views at the time that the first thing that came out of my mouth was, Allahu Akbar, God is great. And as I came to the office building in which I worked, you have to drive up the driveway, and then you see the building. And then I thought, you know, what if a plane flew into this building right now? You know, I'm down with the cause, you know, but no one's going to give me a phone call to say, get out. I'm going to die with everyone else. And when I, <clears throat> when I went home during lunchtime, and my wife was watching TV, and my good Muslim friends are calling me saying, Mubin, this is not a religion. This is not what we're about. My non-Muslim friends are calling me saying, Mubin, is this your religion? Is this what you're about? And I was assailed from all sides, uh, which forced me to reconsider my commitment to the cause. I, I realized I don't know enough about my religion. I, I should probably go and study it. So I went to Syria in 2002. And, and one of the reasons why there's a huge uh, draw to Syria is because of the, the um, eschatology, the apocalyptic traditions that relate to the end times and the second coming of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And, and these things are huge factors. This is why, uh, why most, the overwhelming majority of foreign fighters are going to Syria. That is the single reason why. Um, and I, and I, this is one of the reasons why I went to Syria. Um, of course, 10 years too early, but, you know, thank God. I mean, God knows where I would have been now. But while I was in Syria, I, I saw, I became disillusioned. I, I saw a real police state, you know, not the, you know, police state phrase that people throw out, I mean, haphazardly, not realizing what it means. I saw it for real, what it meant. I mean, I talked to people who had been imprisoned or disappeared because they said something critical of the government. Um, but most importantly is the time that I spent with a, with a Sufi sheikh, Islamic scholar, who actually helped me go through the verses of the Quran that the extremists used and debunked my interpretations, basically. We spent a year and a half, um, and I realized at the end of it that how little I had, real, I had learned about my religion. And now I had been studying the Arabic, I had been studying you know, what's called usul ad-din, the foundations of the religion. You start to learn exegesis, you learn um, rules of interpretation, uh, all these things that prepare you for interpreting the Quran properly. I had none of that training. No wonder I went down the road that I did. So when I returned back to Canada, first week I'm back. Open the front page, and who's there? Momin Kawaja. Momin Kawaja was arrested in, the, uh, in connection with the London fertilizer bomb plot in 2004. Momin Kawaja was my friend from Quran school. He used to sit right next to me. We used to play with toy cars. He used to go up to his apartment. He, has a, he had an older brother as well. We were cool. I called up, I actually called up the security intelligence service back when there was still a phone book. Remember those things? And uh, now, when I said those words in court, the judge actually interjected and said, wait a second, who does that? Who calls the intelligence services? Right? I'll tell you who. It's a kid who grows up in that kind of environment. Army cadets, he's comfortable with state institutions, becomes disillusioned in Syria, comes back, sees this guy caught up. That's the kind of guy that calls. And so long story short, they, you know, within an hour of the phone call, they had somebody come see me um, and recruited me to, to become an undercover. Uh, and, you know, uh, until the end of 2005, 
Uh, I did infiltration operations in, uh, with extremist individuals. It, it could have been individual, it could have been groups. And <clears throat> like the Toronto individuals, CSIS collects information, the federal police collects evidence for public prosecution. So I traversed over to the RCMP and was operational from December 5th, 2005 to June 2006. To start, I mean, you heard a little bit about their backgrounds, and what I want you to do is keep in mind that linear progressive journey, and you can see how an individual like this gets caught up in it. Born in 84, uh, Soviet invasion is still ongoing, grew up in a refugee camp, arrives in Canada in 1994, settles in Mississauga. It's uh, just uh, outside of the city of Toronto. Uh, Zakaria Mara, I mean, look at the, look at the family background, non-practicing Muslim mother, relatively practicing Christian mother. Hmm. Mix, mix uh, family. Father's got a job with an old company. He's never home. They were, they come to Canada. The parents divorce. Zachariah tells me the day his father left, he threw him the car keys. Never saw him again. Yeah, gangster culture. Because before they were quoting Osama bin Laden, they were quoting Fifty Cent, right? Rapper, right? Famous rapper. And, and the reason why is this. It's because of the mentality that comes with gangster culture. That's why you see a lot of these rappers and rapper wannabes uh, who, who end up with ISIS. Um, you know, Amwazi, so-called Jihadi John, you know, failed rapper guy. There's a uh, Deso Dog, a, Ger uh, a German uh, individual who went over and uh, he was pretty popular and they, they exploited him for PR purposes. So. So what happens is they form a group in, in Meadowvale Secondary School called Brothers of Meadowvale, and they start to use religious terminology, and uh, they move away from their, their rap background. And, and you know, nodes and networks, so they start, to, they start to go to this Islamic center, and we look to see, you know, who else is coming here. Abdul Qayyim Jamal, really older guy. Uh, an outcast from his community. He was always railing on against Canadian foreign policy. And people kind of, you know, just saw him as a nuisance. But these guys didn't. And they all came together, right? So and I'm, I'm taking this blob from Mark Sageman's uh, idea of, uh, of bunch of guys theory, bogs. You know, where there are a bunch of guys, problems will follow, right? Um, so in a blob, you have people and places and how people interact uh, with each other in those places, right? So one of the things I say is that, you know, if you're investigating a biker gang, uh, you're probably going to end up in a, in a bar or strip joint. Or if you're investigating uh, white supremacists, wait a second, you probably end up in a bar and strip joint again. Uh, the point is, these are their places of socialization. And so from the state level, we don't say, obviously, nobody, we don't target mosques for surveillance. It's ridiculous. Um, but if you're following somebody and they go to the mosque, you're going to end up in the mosque. That's what happened to me many times. But something happens, and as uh, Anne had mentioned, Fahim gets married. He gets married, and he has to move to another part of the city. He's living with his uh, wife's parents. And his wife has a younger brother who's going to this high school. And so who else is going to that high school? This is Amin Durrani. This is his picture at 16 years of age. He was lecturing the boys, you know, don't talk to the girls. And he was telling the girls, which I guess he wasn't supposed to be talking to, don't talk to the boys, cover your hair. And so in this area of the city is another mosque that he starts to, to attend. And look who else is attending, Jamal James. Now, look at the name. It's Jamal because he comes from Rastafarian background. And God, or the deity, is Ja, right? Ja Rastafari. So he takes Jamal, which is an Arabic word, and he melds the two together. And really what this is, think about it. It's identities. You're, you're melding, you're bringing your identities together, your previous identity with your new found one, and you're trying to merge it together. So second blob forms, of course. But it, they're not the only ones there, right? Like Anne had mentioned, blob three is Abid Khan from the UK. And blob four are two individuals from Atlanta, Georgia, who had taken a trip up to, to Canada. So they're talking online. And here's an example of the video that was made right here in D.C. You'll hear him say, hold on, let me focus on it. It's a standard...
taking pictures clandestine way. Uh, yeah. They're really paranoid. They, they think people are following them, and they are. <laughs> it's a police checkpoint from far away. And then what they do is they'll come a little bit closer and take another scan of how things work. Man. What are the chances of that passing by? But this is your critical infrastructure target. Now, there's symbolism to the targets. There's a tactical, there's a cultural target, of course. Now they're closer to the checkpoint. What? There's what? There's what? Huh? Anyways, uh, their paranoia was well founded. Uh, so what starts to happen is they stop their talk, they start their action. 2005 March. I'm not inserted into the group yet. But Abid Khan gets on a plane, comes to Toronto. These two get on a Greyhound bus, come to Toronto to meet these three individuals. Shortly thereafter, watch how quickly things start to accelerate. By June, Abid Khan is in Pakistan. Um, Fahim Ahmed is ordering guns across the border and, and reference to some individuals who had been caught. Sadiqi goes to Bangladesh. Harris Ahmed goes to Pakistan, meets up with Abid Khan. Jamal James goes to Pakistan for training. And along with Durrani, I mean Durrani, Fahim organizes this training camp. Because you can't send 15, 20 guys to Pakistan for training. You can send three or four guys who would then come back as senior instructors, train your cell of individuals, and conduct attacks. So this is just a link analysis chart uh, that law enforcement people use. But it just shows you that, uh, you know, how tentacles reach out like that. Uh, Yunus Suli, son of a Moroccan diplomat living in London. When they raided his house, he was literally in the process of building a website, teaching kids how to make a suicide vest. There was more information picked off of him than Osama bin Laden. So, my formula is very simple. Regular involved visits to jihadi sites and forums that have the ideological justification and frequently viewing these jihadi videos, immersing yourself in, the, in watching um, horrible acts, plus the perceived self-duty that you, you got to do something about it, this is a person that's ready to pop, okay? I mean, think about the emotional toll it takes on you. I, I have, I'm completely desensitized to watching beheadings. I've watched, I don't even know how many. Um, you know, the, the gurgling of blood coming out of the throat, it's just like, meh. And it's, it's like a, you know, I, it messed with my head for a little while. I mean, now it's kind of, you know, in you know, kind of further back in history, but when you're sitting there and you're watching this stuff over and over and over, you're not a human if you don't feel you need to do something about it. When it's very, when you see people being hurt, oppressed, persecuted, you feel you got to do something. Especially young people, they feel we have the physical ability to do it, so why don't we do it? So as, as uh, we, we heard, the plan was very simple. Three one-ton ammonium nitrate truck bombs. One to take out the CSIS building, one to take out the Toronto Stock Exchange, which would have devastated the economy, I guess, uh, and one to hit a Canadian Forces base where our fallen soldiers are repatriated. So the idea is, look at the psychological impact. We're killing your people a second time. So this is a, an example. Uh, this is a video that they took. Now, this is just edited with, with stuff on it, but... That's the tent that we set up. Now this is a staged scene of we are coming to your lands and we're planting our flag. Right? That guy is, not that guy, sorry, but the one on the right, that guy there, former US res, uh, uh, Canadian Army reservist. So the flag is planted. And this was to send to people in Pakistan to say, look, we got guys here who are training. Send help, right? Um, we were doing firearms training. Allah, 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 
Now, I had to train them, make them feel like they were doing something, but at the same time, not give them any actual training. I had to teach them the safe handling of the firearm because I didn't want one of them to get shot in the back of the head or something. That would have been, you know, see, the government sent in agents to kill your kids, right? So remember I told you that making your own videos and things like that, these are indicators of um, violence extremist acts and offenses. This was billed as uh, evasive maneuvers. That's just me doing donuts in the parking lot. <laughs> can't resist it. I can't. All right. Um, Zechariah Mara took a course. Now look up in the top of the screen. You're going to see, can you see the tools up there? You see a toaster. Okay. Now watch just when it screens up there. I want you to, this is in his basement. He's testing his bomb detonator. Okay, he's taking a college course on fire systems technician or something. See the car seat? See the jumper, the kid's toy? This is all him, right? His supporters, of course, after he was caught, he said, no, no, it was a school project. Okay, it's lit. One, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,004, 1,005, 1,006, 1,007, 1,008, 1,009, 1,010, 1,011, 1,012, 1,013. Boom. Bomb goes off. So what they had done was they learned from details publicized from court cases about how the government would come in and surreptitiously remove stuff so they set it up in such a way that that couldn't be done so here they are putting their stuff away and um, they come outside and then they hear some kind of commotion oh dear and that was the end of them that was the end of them so that's how the, the Toronto case itself ended in 2006. I spent four years in five legal hearings uh, in court as a primary fact witness. Um, and like I said, uh, since then, I mean, I did a master's degree. I'm doing my PhD in psychology now. And, and I've been very involved on Twitter. And so now I'm going to go into my second uh, part of my presentation. I think you will really, really enjoy this. I don't know how many of you have actually seen um, jihadi recruiting videos at the, you know, the high production value ones that they keep telling you about. I'm going to show you them. I mean, at the end of the day, look, this is this is from October, not of last year, of the year before, 2014. Look at what they're saying. We use Twitter and YouTube the same time we do battle, and and really the top thing is the the, the top one is really what it comes down to. It's not how many people are killed. It's how many people are watching. And this is them asking jihadis who are there, hey, what kind of phone should I bring, right? So you got iPhones here? Don't bring iPhone. Security problems. Uh, if I join ISIS, do I have to wait, or can I just start fighting right away? And they, they're ask, answering you, look, weapon will be given free, ammo is free, after training you're going to do a ribalt, which is like sentry duty. And the people are doing this online in full view of everyone, okay? Um... How do, get people, how do people get tazkia, meaning like how do you get a recommendation? Or if look at on the bottom, what about people who are married? So, hey, you get housing, you get paid extra for every wife and kid, right? I mean, when you get married, you get 700 bucks from ISIS, dollars American, okay? So imagine you're some 14, 15-year-old kid, you got to do homework, got no job. What future prospects do you consider yourself having? 700 bucks to go and fight and be a hero overnight? Sure. You know, while everyone was scouring for intelligence and all that good stuff, I started to see a theme. Food picks. So Swedish gummy bears posted by Swedish jihadi. Kebabs, yeah, we got that. They're trying to show that it was a really good life that they were living there. And the land of Pepsi, Coke is still king. How could I not take a picture of that? Nice little milkshake. He's dead. No, he's a Canadian guy. Him and I had. This really, for me, sums it all up. An Indo-Pak, Indo-Pakistani, from Britain, now in Syria, referring to pizza as home-cooked food. Right? I mean, there are products of the West. I mean, we have this idea, that, oh my God, look at their videos, they're so cool. And Yeah, they're, they're born and bred in this environment. So, you know, for others, it's actually, yeah, this is, you know, he's just started uh, enjoying cooking. 
Now, I can show you pictures of uh, even uh, the profiles of women. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. I mean, I have so many of them. But I think the bottom one captures, sums it up. It's the idea that to be a caring wife of the Mujahid today and loving mother to the Mujahid tomorrow, the idea of populating the Islamic State, of being the first generation, the chosen few, the vanguard. And hey, jihadi eye candy. Ever heard that term? Look at this. As a teenager, I wanted to get my piece of eye candy and take a good look. And for some reason, the jihadis I saw on video, they all look really hot. Hmm. So the idea of romance. Look at this. The love of jihad till martyrdom do us part. And martyrdom did part them both. They were both killed. So, of course, there's the idea of the plight of the innocents, because what is happening in Syria is, I mean, I think we've lost the words to describe it. Right? And these people are seeing this and they're acting on it and they're responding to it. Uh, more screen grabs of profiles of individuals. So I have this guy following me on Twitter. And, and it's weird because some of them, they know who I am. Uh, I'm an apostate, according to them, because I work for the intelligence services. Uh, and then in the beginning, for about eight months, there was a lot of trash talk back and forth. And I had to stave off a lot of this criticism from them. But as, as they realized that I knew what I was talking about, and uh, I, for example, I, I knew that ISIS was going to declare a caliphate, so I switched my handle to caliphate cop. And people were asking me, why would you do that? And I said, watch, they're going to do it. And they did it. 